On this episode of Narcissist Apocalypse, we talk with an abuse survivor named Carrie, and Carrie was married to a controlling Mr. Wright. It's a story of the hero complex, anorexia, gaslighting, financial abuse, trauma, and community support. Welcome to Narcissist Apocalypse, everyone. I am Brandon Chadwick, and with me today, we have Carrie. How are you? I am surprisingly very nervous. I'm very nervous today. <laughs> and you do your own podcast, so, you know, it's different when you're on, on this end. It is so different on the other side. And it's different because it's also, I mean, I'm very being very vulnerable with you today. So that's, you know, I'm a little nervous. Well, thank you for being here. And if you want to be a guest like Carrie is today, please do go to our website at NarcissistApocalypse.com and click on the guest form button at the top of the page. And there you can read all of our instructions and please read them all and either send us an email at NarcissistApocalypse at gmail.com or fill out our guest form and press the submit button and please do send it in the format that we ask for. And there is a content warning for this episode as we do graphically discuss sexual coercion and abuse, suicidal ideation, physical abuse, and a graphic description of a car accident. So that is your content warning for today. And today you're going to hear Carrie's story and Carrie was married to someone who had an addiction, but this was a food addiction in an anorexia case, an anorexia nervosa and a lack of food. And there's a lot of mental health stuff going on, but there's also abuse going on as well. And Carrie went through a lot. Her family has been through a lot and it is big traumas and little traumas, some life and death situations not related to the abuser. Just a lot going on in this marriage and with the family. So just a big thank you to Carrie for being here with us. And now I'm going to get out of my way and your way. Carrie, the floor is now yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. So um, I would like to set the stage. Let me set the stage uh, and give you some background information. So I was born... Uh, on a ranch out in West Texas, very large cattle ranch, and I was the baby of six kiddos. My dad was previously married. He brought two children into the marriage, and my mom was previously married, and she brought three children into the marriage. And then 10 years after all of those kids were born, I was born, and I was not just the baby of my family. I was the baby grandchild of this very large Texas family, and uh, I was very loved. I was very doted on. They always joke that I never cried because there was always someone there to pick me up. Um, I had a lot of positive affirmations coming to me as a child. You're so beautiful. You're, you're so smart. You're so, you know, just really nurturing environment that I was born into. And I think a lot of that is because I was the baby of the family, even though it was a blended family and there was a lot of chaos and a lot of tension in the home between the step siblings and the step parents. Um, But I was very loved and my grandparents played a very significant role in my life, both sets of grandparents. And I had um, a wonderful aunt who was just, just enveloped me with love. I really spent a vast majority of my childhood with my grandparents or my aunt because my parents were dealing with five teenagers and two of those teenagers had some pretty severe issues that they were, um, you know, trying to help them out with. But during this, you know, very idyllic Americana type environment where I'm on you know, 6,000 acres and I'm surrounded by animals and there's a creek that runs through the property and I'm playing in the creek all the time. And I have this huge imagination and this sweet little, you know, small town school that I go to. I was very lonely. I was a very lonely child in a lot of ways because my siblings were so much older to me and we were remote. 
We are in the middle of nowhere. I don't grow up with neighborhood kids I can go play with. And uh, God blessed me as an extrovert. <laughs> that is who I am. I love people. I love being around people. Well, there, when I was about five and a half years old, there was um, a neighbor, and by neighbor, I mean probably a mile away, that moved in, and uh, they had another five-year-old, and we became friends. But that five-year-old had an older brother, a teenage brother who was, I don't know, 17, 18, 19 years old. And over the course of two years, he sexually molested me. And that really nurtured Brandon cognitive dissonance at a very early age. And it taught me how to disassociate very quickly. And so I had these two realities in childhood. One reality being I was very loved. I was precious. I was smart. I was beautiful. I was artistic. I was told I was artistic from a very early age. I'm a performer, you know, and then this other reality that was happening in my brain was you're worthless. You're shameful. You're a bad girl. You're, um, you're a liar. You are nothing more than your sexuality. And that really caused this fracture in my being. It, it caused a fracture in my soul and it led to some very bad decisions. And it also led to some very beautiful decisions in my life. So I'll be 45 soon. So it's, it's 40 years ago. This happened to me 40 years ago. And um, so that's kind of setting the stage of just like where I was. And I'd like to just set the stage of where, who I called the wolf. He is a wolf in sheep's clothing. So I'm going to just refer to my um, husband as the wolf. And he also had a very difficult upbringing. And I don't want to tell his story, but I I do want to set the stage for what he endured. And this was just what I have learned from him or family members, but he also came from a blended family. His mom and dad, they had a rough marriage. His mom was a cocaine addict. She was an anorexic. She was an alcoholic. His dad is very uh, emotionally disconnected, very controlling, probably very narcissistic, to be honest with you. And for lack of a better word, he's just an asshole. Like, he is just an asshole. He doesn't have friends (laughs) to this day. He's just, you know, he piggybacks on other people's friends. He's just not a nice guy. And they would beat the ever-living crap out of him. He, He had several broken legs and arms by the time he was five. Um, very suspiciously, you know, he's coming from a very educated, wealthy white family that is probably getting away with things that they shouldn't be getting away from. His parents divorced. His mom then quickly married a felon who got out of prison, continued to abuse him, continued to neglect him and his brothers. And uh, his only saving grace, I think, was when he was 12, his stepmom came in the picture. She's a very sweet lady. She's a very nice lady, very sweet lady. And she brought with her, her three sons. So he grew up in a house at age 12 with six teenage boys. They were all about the same age. So you can imagine six teenage boys in one house. There's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of competition. There's a lot of rough housing. There's a lot of testosterone. There's a lot of boundaries being pushed. I mean, these boys were selling drugs out of their bedroom window. They were throwing parties while mom and dad were on their honeymoon. It was, it was wild um, and really sad at the end because the youngest brother became a terrible drug addict and he ended up losing his life to that addiction. And it was, it was very sad for that family. In my experience with that family, there's a lot of pain, a lot of trauma. There are some good eggs in the basket but uh, it's a difficult family. So that just kind of sets the stage for him and the stage for me. And I, you know, as I grow up, I, I play sports, I do team sports, but I really fall in love with the stage. I fall in love with theater. And I didn't even know theater was, uh, existed in my small little upbringing, isolated on a ranch, but my, my daddy was a home builder and there was a huge boom in Houston. So he moved us to Houston in the 90s, and I walked into this huge school. It was a 5A school. It was a very big school. 
blew my mind. I mean, I had never even seen a nose ring before, you know, like, whoa, what is, what is this, <laughs> what is this culture I've just walked into? And, uh, and I found the stage and I fell in love with it. And I have been doing theater since, since ever since, since I was 13 years old and, uh, and do it professionally. Now it was a beautiful move in a lot of ways because I met some incredible friends. I have been friends with these girls since junior high. We have remained friends our whole lives. And I bring that up because it is an integral part of the story. They've really saved my life many times, many times over. Um, I happened to go to high school with the wolf. I did not know this. I didn't know him. He wasn't involved in anything. I was the entertainer of the class. I got a senior superlative, most talented. I was in all the productions. I was in just about every extracurricular you can think of. And, uh, and I was well-liked. I was, I was popular in a sense that I was well-liked and I was well-liked because I was funny and kind and very empathetic. Um, but I leave high school and I go to film school and I do acting jobs and I find myself back in my hometown in West Texas. And I don't know what to do. I'm 21, 20 years old, I think. And so I decide to go to real university. <laughs> and I, I go to the real university is what I called it. And I met my first husband and we were both very young. We were both artistic. We were both like, you know, free spirits and wild child personalities and uh, fell passionately in love with each other very quickly and decided to get married. Now I'm raised, it was raised a, a good little Lutheran girl and I always wanted to be a mom and you couldn't be a mom until you got married. So I was like, yeah, let's get married. I'm ready to be a mom. Let's, let's do this thing. Let's jump on the baby train. So I married my first husband and um, looking back now, I can see where he was very grandiose in nature. I, I can't say he was a narcissist, but there, there were some, there were some signs there were some red flags. He had deep mother wounds. He was also very abused by his mother physically. You know, he was neglected by his mother. His mother brought in boyfriend after boyfriend who just beat him. It was really, it's really sad. Um, but that marriage resulted in two children and, uh, and he, he abandoned us. He left. I got kind of got lucky actually, because he just, he just said, I don't want to be a dad. I can't do this. He packed his bags and he left. So here I was with two babies, going to college full-time, 21 hours a semester. I was a declared theater major and then decided to just make life interesting and did a double major in history, which is these two majors are no, they're no joke. I mean, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of time. And, uh, and I was working three jobs. I don't, I look back at that time and go, oh my gosh, how did I even do that? But you know, I have such a zest for life. I love life. I love opportunity. I love meeting new people. I love working. I love working. And I got through it and I graduated with honors and I had these two kids, but it was very difficult. I, I don't want to make light of it too much because it was very difficult. I was so brokenhearted. I was so brokenhearted that I had to get a divorce from my first husband. I really loved him. I probably would have stayed with him 10 years longer than I should have ever stayed with him. But during this time, I was seeing a counselor and it's such a cliche, like sex in the city moment. And I'm in my twenties and I'm sitting with this counselor and I'm like, I am never doing this again. I'm never getting married again. I don't want to get a broken heart again. And, and I'm not even going to date anybody again. It was me. I was not. And, and so we make a list, right? like Carrie Bradshaw, we're going to make a list and he has to check off every box before I'll even go on a date with him. Right. And I have this list in my head. And this brings me to our 10 year high school reunion. And I'm walking into our 10 year high school reunion with this list in my head, this really difficult period of life that I had just lived. I didn't even want to go to the stupid reunion, but my best friends, these best friends that I've had, 
basically threatened to come take me, kidnap me and bring me to Houston and go to this reunion. So I go to the reunion and it's also my birthday. The reunion is held on my birthday. So they take me to dinner first. I have an entire bottle of wine. Brandon, I'm not a drinker, but when I do drink, I go all out. I, I have the motto, go big or go home. And so I was already one bottle of wine <laughs> in to the night, walking into that reunion. And I don't even know how much I drank at the reunion, but it's quite a funny story. Everyone still jokes about it that I go to high school with because I managed to get on the microphone at one point and, uh, and get everybody on the dance floor. It was, it was quite entertaining. And, and since then, we've had other reunions where they jokingly give me the microphone. But I meet the wolf for the first time. And I just went on and on. I remember going, I don't remember you. How do I not remember you? I knew everybody in high school. Of course, now I know he, he didn't have any friends. He didn't talk to anybody. He didn't, you know, he played soccer, I think, for a very short time and tried to hang out with those guys. But nobody really remembered him. And those that did remember him have since told me, man, he was weird. He was this. He was that, you know. At our at our twenty year high school reunion, as these high school reunions go, different groups show up at different times. And one of my friends in high school came up to me and he goes, "That guy, you married that guy?" Like everyone was just so surprised. Like he was like the, you know, you go to the nineteen nineties rom coms and he's like the nerdy guy that no one sees, but he's really this amazing guy. He's like uh, Patrick Dimsey's character on the lawnmower, you know, like coming in, like that's, that's who he was to me. That's how I saw him. And, um, and I guess I kind of saw myself as that girl who everybody knew. And, you know, he was really interesting to me and Facebook was new at this point. And it was new to me. It was 2007 or eight or something. And, um, I had just, got Facebook, you know? So he was on Facebook and we started emailing each other, what I called emailing. I think it's DMing now or Facebook messenger or whatever, but we would email each other through Facebook and it's, we just started every day. I mean, it was like three, four times a day, back and forth, back and forth. And man, when you go through something like this, when you get to the end of it, or you get to the point in your story where you're aware of who you're actually dealing with. When I became aware this man was a wolf, I gave him every detail of my life in those multiple emails. My dreams, my fears, my wants, my desires, my my favorite color, my family dynamic. I gave it all to him. And he sure did use it. He He used it in a very passive aggressive covert way but in the moment like when you're in that moment you just feel so loved and seen and I was so shocked because this guy was checking all the boxes I I just was I just I was excited I was falling in love with him and I thought now nah, this is a guy that that I could be with, you know, and I have these two children that I'm super protective of. I do not want them to have a childhood abuse story like I had. So I am very protective. I've always been very protective of my children. I would cut off my own arm before they ever had to experience or endure the trauma and the abuse that I had to experience. So we date, we talk online for about four months, and then we have our first date. And it was six months after our first date that I introduced my children to him. And this whole time, everything is going really well. And he interacted with the kids beautifully. And I had zero concerns that he would ever sexually abuse them. And I, and I'm right. I'm still right. I still feel that way. He, that's not who he is. Brandon, he had a job. He had a house. He was responsible. He was kind. He was soft-spoken. He was very, um, very thoughtful in a sense where he would think through something before he 
put it into action or words. Like he was not impulsive at all. And I thought, wow, this is the complete opposite. He, he's very different physically than anything I've ever dated. I go for like big, beefy football players, cowboys, you know, what I'm used to, what my family is a very tall, very broad shoulder. My, my brother had a full scholarship to Texas Tech playing football. I mean, we, my nephews went to state playing football. We're just big, you know, he's this tall, skinny, you know, guy, blonde, green eyes, totally opposite of what I've ever known. And because my heart was so broken for my first marriage, I was, I was determined to do the opposite of what I did, which is so dumb because of course I had all this unhealed trauma. So I'm going to go exactly to the place that I'm familiar with. You know, it's, it's like a magnet, this trauma. It's just, it's just a magnet, this unhealed crap that the world does to us sometimes. But after, um, you know, after a year and a half, and I feel very comfortable with him around the children, we have lots of serious conversations about moving in together, possibly getting married in the future. Uh, that was a hard no for me. He was pushing the marriage. I was like, eh, I really, I don't need to be married. I don't need to be married to have children. I, that was a just some stupid lie I told myself. Like, I am good to just be your life partner. <laughs> I just don't want to do that again. Uh, I think, again, during that time, he was feeling me out. He was wondering what I would permit. Because what you permit, you promote. So if I permitted a boundary to be bended or crossed, I'm promoting it. And he was looking, he was fishing. He really was. But I made the decision. I was like, okay, I'm going to leave this beautiful life and take my beautiful children from the only home they know. And I'm going to take a risk and I'm going to trust you. And I'm going to move to Houston, which is six hours away from our ranch. And it was, it was a, a beautiful, exciting eight months, <laughs> eight months. It was really nice. And then we were invited to go to a wedding, his cousin's wedding in North Carolina. This was going to be a big deal. It was a big trip. Um, I had just started this job and I was like, I don't know if I can take time off. I don't, you know, it's kind of like a corporate job. It's a big girl job. <laughs> I'm not doing it. I think I'm doing a big girl thing. Like, well, I don't know if I can take work off, but I ended up take, being able to take it off. And the deal was, okay, we can take my car because my car was new and we'll drive and we'll make a vacation out of it with the kids, but you have to pay for it because I can't afford it. And I am financially independent from the wolf. I'm financially independent from the wolf for a very long time in the beginning of our relationship. And he agreed. So we're in Houston, Texas. By the time we cross the Mississippi state line, the mask is off. And I go, oh my God, this is terrible. He's paying for it. Therefore, he's in control of when we stop, what we buy, when we eat, what we eat. If we get souvenirs, if we don't get souvenirs, he's like, no, we're just going to go to the store every time we stop and get peanut butter and jelly. Like there, I was like, well, my kids don't eat peanut butter and jelly. Well, that, well, we have to get just rice and beans. How do you cook rice and beans? Like, well, we're just eating cheap. I was like, okay, but I have children and children don't just eat necessarily what you put in front of, like they eat what they know. They eat what they like the picky. It's just like a whole thing. And it was such a terrible drive. By the time we got to North Carolina, I was just beside myself. You know, I would say we need to go the quickest route because I have a four and a six year old in the car. And any mom knows you don't want to drive 12, 14 hours with a four and a six year old. You have to break up the drive. It's like, no, 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 we got to take the scenic route. Well, the scenic route on the East Coast, I've learned, is stoplight after stoplight after stoplight. And it added four hours to our drive. We were all exhausted. I was furious. The kids were upset. He didn't care. He dropped us at the hotel, said, I'm going to go find my family, took the car and completely abandoned us at this hotel. I have pretty much no money. You know, I'm living paycheck to paycheck because I'm financially independent. I'm going to do it on my own. I have a little bit of money on my credit card and I'm like, what do I do? 
And I'm totally embarrassed because my parents told me, they were like, don't move down there. This is, this is a bad idea, but I'm stubborn. I'm like, no, I'm going to make it work. You know, it was, it was so bad that by the time I survive this wedding, which I was not welcomed at, his family absolutely hated me. His brothers and their wives were very unkind to me. I could not understand why. I have never in my life not gotten along with people. I have never in my life not been able to mesh with any group of people. I now understand he was triangulating those relationships from the very beginning. He was telling them all sorts of things. Then he's telling me they don't like you. You're just a gold digger. You're just looking for a baby daddy. And whenever this episode comes out and people are listening to it that know me, they're going to laugh when I say this, but I really do have a, I don't give a fuck attitude. I, you have to, as an actor, if it's someone I know personally and I love, I really care what they think. But if it's a stranger that I really don't know, I don't care. I don't care what you think about me. So the, I, it was just, I came into that going, okay, well, screw you too. Like, I don't need you in my life. That's cool. We're going to, you have your opinion. I have my opinion. Let's, you know, be cordial at a family dinner and move on with our lives. I don't need to be your best friend. So that backfired on him because he wasn't expecting that. I don't think from me, he wasn't expecting me to just be like, I don't, whatever. They don't like me. So then he was in a position of, oh crap. Now what am I going to do? Nobody gets along. Nobody's doing what I want them to do. And I'm at this wedding. Nobody likes me. Nobody's welcoming me. They're all really rude and awful to me. I'm thousands of miles away from home. Very little money. It was terrible. I just had to get home. And the whole time I was like, we're done. I, this is terrible. You drug me out here with my babies and you treated me this way. So we get to Houston and I tell my boss, my boss also, he was such a beautiful man. He was such a sweet man. And he was like, whatever we need to do to get you out of this, we're going to help you. And, um, you know, I'm making pennies compared to him. So at the end of a week, I sit him down. I say, listen, it's just not working. You know, I, it's just, I'm sorry. I'm going to need a couple of weeks to figure out where I'm going to live. But, um, kids and I are going, he was like, yeah, I understand. Yeah, man. But this was like the best decision ever made. I just really, this was good for me. He kept saying that this whole experience was good for me. You know, I disrupted my life, my children's lives, but the experience was good for him. So I'm glad, I'm glad for him. Um, He breaks out a bottle of wine. It's a very important choice of words. He got me pregnant. And I find out very quickly because my body reacts very quickly to pregnancy. Now I'm pregnant. I have two children. And I'm stuck. I call my parents. They're like, well, come home. And I say, and do what? Put my baby in daycare? Because this was a very big deal and a very big piece of information I disclosed to him over and over and over again. And that is, I want to be a mommy first. I'm going to stay with my babies. And with my two older ones, as hard as it was, I kept them out of daycare. I took them to class with me. They were with my parents. There was a a uh, campus nanny that, you know, held on, but I don't, it was important to me. So I made the choice to stay. And it was the worst, probably the worst nine months of my life <laughs> until 2019. It was so terrible. He treated me so terribly. He told me to go get on welfare go get on Medicaid to pay for the baby. He's making $90,000 a year. I refused. He tried to manipulate me into doing it. I refused. I kept my job until the month before I delivered. And the, the month I delivered, he started financially supporting me. This was a huge fight, huge fight. The entire nine months I was pregnant. So on top of the belittlement, the degrading, you're getting so fat. Why are you getting so much weight? 
oh my God, do we really want to do this? Uh, ignoring me, gaslighting me the whole time. And I tell him, you need to give me money so I can stay home with this baby. He wouldn't do it. He wouldn't do it. And finally said, listen, you're either going to give me money or I'm gone. And I'm having this baby at home at a ranch. Like I'm not, I'm not doing this with you, man. So he agreed, but he only agreed if it was a shared checking account that he would deposit money into. I now have come to understand why he did this because he wanted to know what I was spending money on. He wanted to control it. He wanted to use it against me. He wanted to throw it in my face. He, I mean, I, so I had two accounts at this point. I had one account that was mine, and then I had a shared account. Well, Banana was born. And Banana, I was on such a baby high. She, she is the sweetest baby. She was the most precious. She had this big round face and these big green eyes and this bushy lion hair head blonde. She's just, oh, she is my kindred spirit. She is my lighthouse. And Harry and Jay, you know, Harry and Jay, Harry got along beautifully with the wolf. He really doted on Harry. Harry was like the golden boy, you know. For him and bio dad, Harry and Jay are my two previous children. And, um, you know, in a lot of ways, the wolf was better for Harry when he was younger than I was because he was much more patient with him. But, uh, and he was, he was a very hyper child, very kind, beautiful child, but hyper. And I was under a lot of stress pretty much the entire entirety of his uh, childhood, which we'll get to the other crises that happens, but everyone was just so happy when she was born. We were all so happy and I was home and I was living the dream, man. I was making breakfast, big breakfast and packing lunches. And I was on the PTO and I was volunteering at school and I was at home with my baby and I was, you know, decorating the house and making the house. And it's what I've always wanted. It's really what I was told I should be. I was told to marry a cowboy and be barefoot and pregnant in the kitchen on a ranch somewhere. That's literally what I was told like verbatim from many, many people in my family. And, and, um, I said, yes, but I'm also going to be an actor and I'm also going to work and I'm also going to have my independence, but barefoot and pregnant in the kitchen sounds great. I always wanted seven kids. God blessed me with six, but I've always known I was going to be a mom. And it was, it was just a beautiful period in in our story. And when banana was about nine or 10 months old, I had an opportunity to audition for a show in Houston. And this was a very big show. It was a national show that was going to take a venue in Houston for two years. This is the dream. I mean, this is what I worked for my whole life. I had done acting jobs and stuff and I went to film school and I had a degree, but this was an opportunity that I just felt really good about. And it turns out I got cast. I did not tell him I was going to audition for the show. I did not tell him I was auditioning for the show because when I first moved to Houston, I auditioned for a show and I was cast as Kate in Taming of the Shrew as a lead role. It is not an easy role. It is a fun role. It is a funny role. And I was very excited that I got cast. He threw a tantrum, told me I was going to have an affair He couldn't do it. He didn't want me to do it. And I said, I will give up this role one time and one time only for you for the sake and in good faith of our relationship. So I did not tell him I was auditioning for this role, but I did. And uh, lo and behold, I got cast. This was a big deal. Houston has a solid, very large theater district. This show was going to run for two years. I was going to be paid a lot of money. I was going to have an open invitation into the union, which is not easy to get into. And I would get representation from an agency there in Houston. It was a dream. I was living the dream. I was an actor and a mom. It's all I've ever wanted to be. I was so excited and very nervous to tell him that I got cast. The day I got cast happened to be a a night that I was going to go out with friends. And this was a big deal because, man, I didn't get to do that very often. He really loved to isolate me. Try to cage a tiger. Okay. I 
love people. I love getting out. I love, I, I have to. It's how I energize myself. But boy, there were lots of fallouts if I dared do anything by myself. I had to have the baby with me all the time. He didn't want to watch the baby. Watching the baby's too hard. The baby wants her mama. Where, where's the mom? Oh, how selfish are you for going out with your friends? That's what I would hear. You're so selfish. Your baby cried for you for two hours while you took a two-hour break to go have dinner with your best friends. So for me to go out that night was a really big deal. So I call him. I say, hey, listen, I got cast in the show. And I was prepared. I was like, this is how much money I'm going to make. This is the time. This is my plan. Like I had to approach it like I was approaching my father. Like, hey, daddy, I really want to do this. <laughs> you know, I'm a, I'm a grown ass woman. But I, it was, there was going to be a huge fight if I didn't come to him with like a data sheet of all the benefits of doing the show. And his initial response was, oh, wow, wow, that, wow, that sounds great. He gets home, we exchange kiddos and, you know, communication and I'm out the door and I am just high on life. I'm so excited. My friends are so excited for me. Everybody's just like cheering me on like, yes, you're doing it. It's great. It's going to be a fantastic show. I come home at like 11, not an unreasonable hour. I go to bed. He drags me out of bed at two o'clock in the morning and he takes me downstairs and we're in the kitchen. And this man, it is unlike anything I have ever experienced at that point. He was shaking. He was elevated. He was pacing back and forth. His eyes were black. And I've heard this from your other guests. And I thought, oh my God. I thought I was, I thought I was losing my mind. He has, he has beautiful green eyes. They were black. He was pissed. And this is the first time the thought comes to me, this guy's about to hit me. This guy is about to knock my ass on the ground. And I put the kitchen bar in between me and him. And he just talks in circles for hours. You're going to cheat on me. How could you do this to our family? You're so selfish. What's wrong with you? Why do you need people to like you? It's like you want this whole audience to like you and applaud you. Why do you need that? Like, what's wrong with you? You know, you're going to cheat on me. And the whole time, Brandon, I'm looking for objects that I can use to protect myself. That is how scary this moment was. I thought, he's, he's going he's gonna to hit me. And in my mind, I'm going, okay, if he hits me, I have to get to the bedroom, lock the door. I have to call the police. I have to report it. Like, you know, I didn't grow up with men hitting women. I grew up with a grandfather who suspected of killing someone who hurt a woman. Like, we don't do that in my family. We don't like, we're just not the thing to do. You don't hit a woman. And I'm sitting there just going, oh my God, this is about to go down. Finally, around five o'clock in the morning, he walks to the bedroom. I'm going to try to get at least an hour of sleep before I have to get up for work so I can provide for you and your children. Like, well, okay. Like, I got to get up in an hour and take care of three kids. I didn't sleep. I was so shaken. I just was, I just could not believe that happened. And he goes to work and it's all dramatic. And I get Harry and Jay up and I get them to school and I'm sitting there with banana. And I don't recall how I found out. I don't recall if it was a notification on my phone or I just happened to look that day. But as soon as he got to work, he drained the bank account, the shared checking account. He took all the money. And I was in shock. It's like, what? Because that's something else you don't do in my family. You don't financially abandon a woman and her children. That is not being a man. So if I didn't confront it, 
I didn't know if I was going to get any financial support from him. I didn't know if this was going to be happening every time he was displeased with the decision I made. Like, what is going to happen here? So I call him and I say, hey, listen, what happened to the money? He's like, well, I I had to move money around. Why did you move money around? Well, I just had things to do. I have to take care of this family. So I had to move money around. I said, okay, well, you have you have an option here. Option A is you put every penny of that money back in that account and you never do this again and we move on and we don't talk about it or you don't. And I will not do the show, but what I will do is pack my bags and I will go home. Like I'm not doing this with you. And I guess that got through to him because he put the money back and uh, he has only ever financially abandoned me one other time. And we'll get to that a little later in the story. Lo and behold, the show was very successful. It ran 99 performances. It is the longest running show in Houston to date. That's a non-musical. It was a funny show. It was a comedy. It was kind of scripted, kind of improv. It was hilarious, you know, and all these messages I had been getting from him. You were fat. You're not good looking enough. You just have a mom body. You, uh, you, you need to give up this acting dream. You don't even know if you're that talented. When was the last time you were even on stage? All of a sudden I'm getting standing ovations with my co-actor who has, is now a very good friend of mine. Very funny, very talented lady. We're getting standing ovations. We're selling out every night. We're doing this 99 performances. The producers are happy. I'm getting paid. I've been booked with the top talent agency in Texas. I mean, it is glorious. My life is glorious. My career is glorious. I love it. Everything is going great. He's kind of like walking this fine line between being super jealous of my success and then also loving showing me off because I was making him look real good. I mean, I'm on morning shows. I'm on the radio. I'm in the newspapers. So on one hand, it was like, yeah, that that woman belongs to me. Look how good she makes me look. And then on the other hand, he was incredibly jealous of the attention I was getting, the success I was having. Harry and Jay would watch me. I would bring them to the theater with me all the time. They would watch the show. You know, I did not bring banana because banana was too little, but it was, it was so beautiful. And the producers came to us and they said, Hey, listen, Ticket sales are kind of slowing down, so we're going to stop in February, and we're going to start back up in October. We're going to take this break. Um, So you guys have a break, and then we're going to come back, and we're going to run it again for another, you know, six months. Okay, great. I'm excited, and it's a chance for me to kind of, you know, breathe. And uh, my, my agent got me a job in Chicago, so I went up to Chicago a couple of times, and um, on one of those trips, he came with me, and got me pregnant. So I have to call the producers and say, Hey, I'm pregnant. I can still do the show. I'm not going to be showing for a while. And they said, no, it's a liability. We can't because I'm jumping and dancing and running. And I was devastated. Uh, I was happy to have another baby because I love babies, but I was also devastated because I can't do the show. And now we're back to you know, really being truly financially dependent on him because it, you know, I was making a lot of money. He was still giving me money, but it, you know, it was hard. And that pregnancy was by far the hardest pregnancy of all six pregnancies. It was painful. We were running all kinds of tests. There were just a lot of issues going on with me. The The delivery of that baby was very traumatic very difficult. He was a big baby. And, um, and then he was a difficult baby after he was born. He cried all the time. And, and if he wasn't crying, he was sleeping. And something inside of me told me there's something wrong with this baby. In fact, when he was born, I wouldn't leave the hospital. I told the nurse, I was like, listen, this is my fourth kid. This is not my first rodeo. There is something wrong with this child. And to the wolf's credit, he listened to me. And he also advocated 
for me and for the baby. And he said, listen, I, she knows what she's talking about. They checked him head to toe. The pediatrician checked him head to toe for nine months. But at nine months, we discovered why he was crying all the time. And it's because he had cancer. He was diagnosed on March 15th, a very important date in the story, with neuroblastoma. And neuroblastoma is a mean, angry, nasty, insidious cancer. It was all over his body. I was told he wouldn't make it to his first birthday. He was nine months old. So here I am with four children, um, and I was pregnant again. I was five months pregnant with his, his little brother, and we went through 10 months of cancer treatments, and we call him Super G. He is nine years cancer-free. He, he is a very lucky, very lucky little boy. But during this time, Brandon, I was told numerous times that I must want my kid to die. The wolf looked at me and said, well, you must want him dead because I forgot to write down his blood pressure reading on a list that he made that he wanted, even though it's already being recorded by the nurses. He would berate and belittle me with what I fed him, how I fed him. I was no longer breastfeeding him because when I got pregnant with his little brother, my milk, your milk production stops. You're pregnant. Your, your body has to give nutrients to the other baby that you're growing. And so he was bottle fed. Well, you're going to kill him because he's drinking formula. Like how worthless are you that you can't breastfeed him? That might have saved his life. That might save his life. If he was getting breast milk, it might save his life. But I guess we'll give him formula. And I am scared to death for my other three children who went from having a full-time stay-at-home mommy to living with my parents and nannies and babysitters. And mommy lives at the hospital all the time. I am driving him to every doctor's appointment, every specialist appointment, every scan. Uh, The wolf did show up for chemo cycles. So chemo cycles, we would be in-house for three to four days at a time, depending on the cycle we were on. We have a huge following for Super G. And, uh, and, And a lot of people know the Super G story. But nobody knew what I was having to endure in this marriage while fighting for my son's life, while being pregnant, and being the mother of three other children. Nobody knew the things he was saying to me. Um, The constant gaslighting, I, I really started to lose my sense of reality. I was so afraid I was going to make a mistake with my son's medical treatment, which is silly. I know any cancer mom that's listening to this is probably feeling the same way. You're so afraid of any one little thing that could truly break the camel's back when it comes to childhood cancer, because it's hard to survive childhood cancer. But it truly was out of my hands. And to be told that I wanted him dead, to be told, well, this is just how you're perceiving it. You're just too emotional. That's what your problem is. You're just too emotional. You're not thinking logically. I don't know what you're talking about. I never said anything like that. It's not my problem that you feel that way. It was a very large burden to bear. The day that our son had his tumor recession. Uh, it's going to be a 10 hour surgery, very scary surgery, may not live through the surgery. I am 
about 38 weeks pregnant. And um, he's in surgery, and I've got to eat, as pregnant women do. So we go to the cafeteria, and I get blueberry pancakes. And I'll never forget this, because you never forget what you eat when you get food poisoning. <laughs> and I got blueberry pancakes. And about two hours after I ate them, I was starting to feel the effects of said food poisoning. Luckily, we decided to get a hotel at the hospital, across from the hospital, because he was going to be in the PICU for a long time after the surgery. So luckily, we had a hotel, and I went across to the hotel, and I call my parents, who are six hours away. So my parents jump in the car. They drive six hours across the state of Texas to get me in the hotel. They, they guide me to the car. They drive an hour and a half north out of the med center to my hospital. And the whole time, you know, I'm texting the wolf and I'm like, how's the baby? What's the updates? How's the surgery? You know, my mind never leaves Super G through all the puking. (laughs) It never leaves Super G. And my parents are like, and I'm having contractions. And my parents are like, oh my gosh, she's going to have this baby in the car. (laughs) It's like stuff spewing out of my body. It was it's really comical now, but at the time it was just God awful. And the doctor immediately tells me, sweetheart, you are so anemic. You need a blood transfusion. You are so dehydrated. I can't let you leave this hospital. And the blood transfusion thing was a big deal. It kind of shocked me. I was like, oh my gosh. And I knew everything the doctor was telling me that my body was doing, because at this point I might as well be pre-med. I might as well be in medical school, quite frankly. I had learned so many medical terms at that point. I knew how to read, you know, blood work and x-rays and MRIs and MIBGs and CTs. Like, I still do. Um, Luckily, I did not have the baby. And we were able to get me to a place where I could go back down to the med center. I, they released me from the hospital at 4 a.m. By 1 p.m., I was back in the PICU and I was sitting in a chair next to Super G and they don't make it comfortable, these hospitals. They're not like five-star hotels. He's in the PICU and I have a chair to sit in. And, you know, the wolf is tired. He's, he's been up with them. So he goes and he sleeps and he sleeps, I don't know, a long time. From 1 p.m. until the next day, I sat with Super G um, having been recharged <laughs> with blood and, uh, you know, iron and um, hydration. And I'm just praying, don't go, don't go in labor, don't go in labor, don't go in labor. We had a backup plan to have the baby down there. But this little boy, this amazing baby survived so much during that time. And, and childhood cancer is just the worst, worst thing that can happen to a mother and to a child. The last thing you need is someone on your team making you question your own sanity. But we did get through it. And um, I do want to say that the wolf was diagnosed with an inflammatory bowel disease right before cancer. And this is a very important piece of the the story, but it started during that time. And that particular disease causes, you know, uh, severe cramping, discomfort in the bowels, rectal bleeding, weight loss. It can, Um, but he was very particular about food before this diagnosis. He was very concerned about my body and my health, and his body, and his health, and what we put in our bodies, and what was right to eat, and what wasn't right to eat, and how much you exercised, and how you exercised, if you exercised. That was just, I thought, part of his weirdness, you know, part of the Patrick Dempsey character, you know, just just weird, the, the can't buy me love character, you know, the movie, and it's just weird, you know, and um, it really started to escalate during G's cancer. That's when it was like out of control because I think it it became out of control for him, this whole food obsession. 
because our life was out of control with childhood cancer. And I had the most amazing community and church community and friends and family that were feeding us. I I didn't cook a meal for 10 straight months. And, um, but he didn't know what was in the meals. He wasn't in control of the ingredients. He wasn't in control of how it was cooked. He didn't know if it was organic or not organic. And so he became very obsessed with food to a level that I hadn't seen up to that point. Um, after childhood cancer, the gaslighting ramped up. You're not seeing what really happened. The perception one was his favorite. He loved to tell me it's just how I perceived things. It's just how I perceived things. I, I, didn't, I, I didn't really know what was happening. And how could I? I was nursing an infant. I was taking care of a newly minted cancer-free kid that was still on a maintenance regimen. I was still going down to the med center all the time. We were doing scans all the time. Scans are not an easy thing. You have to poke the child with needles. You have to put the child under anesthesia so they're still. Then they wake up from anesthesia, and you have the side effects from that. And this is going on month after month after month while I'm nursing an infant, and I still have three other kids. And this is just how I perceive reality is what I'm being told. It really isn't that hard. I have to work eight hours a day is what the wolf would tell me. I'm working eight hours a day. That's hard, Carrie. Driving your child to get poked with needles and put under for scans while nursing an infant and driving through traffic to get home, that's not hard. What are you talking about? Those are the conversations that I would have with this man. So I'm at this point going, you know what? Maybe he's right. Maybe I'm being a baby. Maybe. I am a worthless piece of shit. Like this one reality from the trauma of my childhood is telling me I am. Maybe he is so right and I just need to do better. And I need to be better. And I need to work harder. And so I did. I worked harder. I did better. At this point, he's telling me, you really need to see a psychiatrist. You need to get on medication. I really want you to get on medication. Which was a flip of the script because before he was like, no, you can't take medication. No, you just got to muscle through it. You got to tough through this to, oh, yes, you need medication. You, You need to make sure you're taking pills. You need to seek mental health, mental health help. There was a point about a year after Super G's little brother was born, and we'll call him Tank. Tank is a name we came up with when he was born because he was a very big kid. He was, he was a 10-pounder. He was like a tank, which was very fortuitous considering his part of the story. But we're sitting at the kitchen bar, and I'm eating a turkey sandwich and drinking a Dr. Pepper. And every Texan knows Dr. Pepper is like the official drink of our state. And he looks at me and he says, I can't believe I have to live with you for the rest of my life. Like, I can't believe I have to watch you put that crap in your body. But I guess that's just what us men have to go through. We have to swallow that pill that whatever woman we end up with is just going to be so fat. But something about that comment just broke me. It just broke me. And I think it's because there was this, these two realities that were constantly in my mind of worthiness versus worthlessness. And I'm only worth my sexuality, but no, I'm beautiful child of God. And, you know, there's these two realities since I was five years old running through my head. And for him to attack me on a level of attacking my sexuality the way he did, it just broke me. And I put the sandwich down and I just started bawling. I just sat there at the bar crying and all my kids were there. They weren't really little anymore. Harry was 
12. Jay was 10. Even Banana at this point was six, five, six years old. And they're watching their mother just break. I didn't even cry in front of them when, when Super G was going through his cancer treatments. I always had a pep in my step. I always had a smile on my face. I've always been a glass half full gal. And he broke me with that comment and I just bawled. And the next day I, um, I told him that I didn't want to be married anymore. I just couldn't be with someone who wasn't attracted to me. And he, oh, no, I'm, no, like, you have, we have to, we have kids. And, um, (laughs) I have not said this out loud very, I've said this out loud to my therapist. I've not said this out loud. But he said, please let me show you how much I love you as he's pushing me into the bedroom. Just let me show you. I'm like, no, I don't want to be married anymore. This, I can't do this. Like, no, I am attracted to you. I am. And um, he got me pregnant. And it was very coercive. You know, I have a hard time saying rape. I have a hard time going to that place. I wasn't screaming no. He wasn't holding me down. But it was, if you don't do this, there's going to be repercussions. If you don't have sex with this man, there's going to be a fallout. And he got me pregnant with my sixth baby, who I call Madam Princess, because she is the boss of the family. And she is so precious. And... um that pregnancy, I became very, very ill around the 24th, 25th week of pregnancy. And I didn't know what was going on. And the doctor didn't know what was going on. And finally, they determined that it was my appendix and I needed to get an appendectomy. And I was terrified. I mean, terrified because they're going to do surgery (laughs) on me and I'm pregnant. And oh my gosh, what does that mean for my baby? And what's going to happen? And We had gone through this huge medical journey with my son, and here I am, 26 weeks pregnant, going into surgery, and the wolf is way more interested in food and what he can eat and what he can't eat and money, and this is going to cost him so much money that I have to have an appendectomy, and I'm laying there scared to death, trying to be brave trying to be positive. He doesn't hold my hand. He doesn't reassure me. He's on his phone the whole time looking up, (laughs) looking up the best place to buy and butcher your own meat. Because to him and his sickness and in his disease, which we find out is anorexia, he has to know where the food comes from so that it is safe enough for him to eat. And he is way more concerned about that than his 26-week pregnant wife about to go into surgery. And when I came out of that surgery, he was not there. He did not show up to that hospital until five hours later, and I was already in my private room. And he came in toting his cooler full of food for him to eat. Didn't think about me, didn't bring me any food, even though the cooler was full of food, crap food that I wouldn't have eaten anyways, but um, that was his food. So I had to call my dad, who was in town, to go get me something and bring it to the hospital to feed me. I'm just devastated at this point in my life. I'm devastated. I'm exhausted. I'm scared. I don't know how I'm going to have another baby with this man. I know he got me pregnant on purpose with Madam Princess. And I had that thought when it happened. And I knew he did it on purpose. And that was the first time I realized he's 
he is getting me pregnant on purpose to control me. Because he knows being a mother is more important to me than anything else in this world. And I will do whatever it takes to be with my babies. I'm not going to dump my babies off somewhere for someone else to raise. I'm not going to do it. It's important to me. I'm not saying it's a bad thing to be a working mom. It is a great thing to be a working mom. But for me, for my heart, I wanted to be with my babies. When I'm 37 weeks pregnant with Madam Princess, Hurricane Harvey hits the Gulf Coast. And Harvey was a jerk. He was a big, fat jerk. He was an unprecedented, incredible hurricane that just decimated the greater Houston area. Everybody flooded. And our home was one of them. Our home was one of them. So when when I'm 37 weeks pregnant, I've already done all the nesting and gathered all the you know, pre-made meals and the baby clothes are washed and everything's ready to go to have this baby, it's gone. In the blink of an eye, it is gone. And I have five other children and two dogs. So now we have no home. I have these kiddos. And uh, again, my community and the church and the neighbor, well, all the neighbors were flooded too, but we were all helping each other out. It was, inc- it was incredible to see the beauty of humanity during Hurricane Harvey. And Hurricane Harvey was a relief for me because the wolf's focus was no longer on me. And it really wasn't even on food. It was on rebuilding our home. And we were very lucky to rent a house uh, in the cul-de-sac across from our home. It's <laughs> one of four houses that didn't flood in our whole street. And uh, we were very lucky to be able to rent that house. But in the nick of time, get the house set up. I go into labor and I have Madam Princess. He shows up for the labor and delivery. An hour after she's born, he leaves. He has to go take care of his food. He has to go prepare his food. It's all about his food. He comes back with the same stupid cooler than he had when I had the appendectomy and I'm I'm on a baby high I'm like oh I love this baby you know I don't even I don't even I ignore him I don't even care I just am so in love with this baby but there is a very big difference with Madam Princess he doesn't hold her he doesn't change her diaper he doesn't sit with her. He doesn't rock her. He barely looks at her. He barely smiles at her. It's like he hates her. And I picked up on this very quickly because with the other three, he was very proud to show them off. He was like, look what I made and um, seemed to very, to love and care for them. And he may have pulled back a little bit with tank. But, you know, we were focused on Super G, but with Madam Princess, oh, man. It's like he hated that child. And he's still, you know, if we are working under the pretense that he has narcissistic personality disorder, which I have experienced and believe that he does, but he's never been diagnosed with, she is his scapegoat. She is the one he is going to hurt the most. Banana is the golden child. But Madam Princess is the scapegoat. And I honestly think he could care less about the boys, even Harry. You know, the boys are just boys. Men are going to do what they want on their own. But the women we control. Very chauvinistic. You control the women. Men will be men. So he didn't really care about the boys. But uh, my oldest daughter, Jay, who's a stepdaughter, could never really be controlled because she was the stepdaughter. And because she is like her mama, she's got a little bite to her. And she becomes very, very, um, and I, and I, I get emotional about it because I hate this for her, but she really 
is an integral piece of me leaving him. Because she knew who he was long before I did. It's funny how children are so perceptive. After her, we rebuild from Harvey and we're kind of back in our home and we're back into a routine and, you know, I have another nursing baby and now I have a two-year-old and a three-year-old and, oh gosh, we're in extracurriculars, we're at church on Wednesdays and Sundays, we're involved in our community, we're a very busy family. He is losing weight. The wolf is losing weight like at a rapid pace. I mean, by the time we're approaching the new year for 2019, he's 127 pounds. He's very thin. The food is out of control. We've done paleo, keto, gluten-free, dairy-free, soy-free. He's now bean-free, onion-free. Uh, it's just insane. So hit, I go into the new year. I go into 2019, and I've had many conversations with my parents at this point. They're like, man, he's so skinny. He's so sick. They're very worried about him. You know, they love him. They care for him. We've all been duped by this guy. We've all been coerced by this guy. We've all been manipulated by this guy. We just, we all really care about him. But at this point, I am so worn down. I don't know what's up, what's down, if the sky is blue or green, if the grass is blue or green. My reality is so fractured because of the gaslighting. And I just think I'm going to give it one last shot. I'm going to go into 2019 and I'm going to give it my all so I can look back and say, you know what? I did everything I could to help this guy with the food situation. And, uh, and then I can wash my hands, say, Hey, I did my part without regret. I can lay on my deathbed and without regret say that I did this. So I did. I I went into 2019 and he gave me a list of uh, ingredients that he had deemed safe for him to eat. And I got real creative and I cooked meals night and day just to get him to eat something. Just to get him to eat something. And I had a dear friend during this time ask me to sub for her. Uh, She's a theater teacher and she's having a baby. And I said, okay. So I hired this nanny to stay with the kids. For six weeks while I go take over her classes. And this nanny looks at me and she's like, I don't, I'm confused. You cook this food, this food? I was like, oh, this is just what he will eat. And she goes, oh no, that's bad. I go, I know. And she goes, he will die. I say, I know, I know he's going to die. But what do I do? We have six children that we're raising. I'm a stay-at-home mom. Like, what do I do? I got to do something. And it, and I'm thinking, I'm just going to pack up my kids and move home to the ranch, right? If it doesn't work out or, you know, whatever. I don't know what I was thinking. But I did know that I was going to try my damnedest. And it was just not working. And so by spring break, by March of 2019, We had planned to go to his parents' house in Colorado and take the children and my niece, who was six months older than my oldest, uh, snow skiing. We're going to go snow skiing and go visit the house and whatever. Um, But he didn't like to drive, so he was going to fly. And I said, well, you want me to drive with seven kids all the way to Colorado by myself? And he was like, yeah, you like to drive. You're the one that drives back and forth to the ranch all the time. Why don't you, you know, because we're going home to visit the ranch. The kids have grown up on this ranch. And I thought, no, I'm not driving with all these babies. We're crazy. So I make him get plane tickets for himself and the three littlest. And then I drive three teenagers and banana to Colorado from Houston. It's like a ridiculous drive, like 20 hours. I don't know. Well, lo and behold, I pick up a bug from one of the students that I'm teaching 
and I get bronchitis. I get a bad virus that turns into bronchitis. That and, and the minute I get to Colorado, I can't breathe. I'm running 103 fever. I'm coughing. I feel like crap. I am on red alert because I have left three of my children with this man. I have no idea if he's going to pass out at any minute. I have no idea how he's going to manage getting three kids that he barely spends time with on an airplane fly to Colorado. I have to go be with his god-awful family for a whole week, whom his dad and uh, stepmom are no longer allowed to be left alone with my children because they physically abused my oldest son. And I flipped shit. And they were not allowed to be alone with my children. They knew it. They were so offended. They were so offended that I wouldn't allow them to be left alone with my children after he hit my son, my, at the time, 10-year-old son, that they didn't even talk to us the entire time Super G was going through cancer and their other grandson was born. This is who I'm dealing with. These are the people I'm going to go visit for a week. With a man who is now 119 pounds. And I'm sick. And I'm like, I got to go to the ER. I have to go to the ER. I can't breathe. I have all this stuff I have to accomplish. I have to cook all these meals just to keep calories in my husband. I have to get my kids to ski school at 7 a.m. tomorrow. I have, you know, my mind is reeling. I'm I'm losing my mind. And my father-in-law goes, well, you can't go to the ER here because it's out of network and that'll really upset the wolf. And I had a fuck you look on my face that must have really scared him because what I have learned about my father-in-law is that he is a coward and so is his son. And I, I go to drive myself up there. And he's like, oh, no, no, I'll drive you. So he drives me to the ER. I'm telling this ER doctor after they take x-rays and blood work. And they're like, you're sick, lady. Like, you're sick, sick. I say, pump me with everything you have. Because I have to be on a mountain skiing in 24 hours. Because I cannot let this man ski down a mountain at 119 pounds with five children without me because he's going to pass out and die. And they're looking at me like I'm crazy and I'm telling them the whole story and they go, this very compassionate ER doctor said, okay, this is what I'm going to do for you. And boy, they just put everything they could in my body. So I get up the next day, I'm still running a fever, I'm on steroids, I'm on antibiotics, I've been drained through IVs all night with all kinds of things, and uh, take the kids to ski school, go to the grocery store, spend a god-awful amount of money on food that I know is just going to be thrown away because we spent, (laughs) this is going to, it makes, I feel ashamed, but we spent up to $3,000 a month on food. 80% of which was thrown away because he decided he couldn't eat it. It wasn't safe to eat. Um, And money is a huge thing in this relationship. Money is a huge problem. I'm being told every day, don't spend money. You're spending too much money. You're flippant with money. I can't trust you with money. You're You're such a terrible budgeter. You don't follow the budget. A budget that changes rules every month because he changes the rules every month. I can't keep up with his rules. And I spend a lot of money on food that just gets thrown away. We ski down this mountain in like a snow cyclone and um, it hits. It's kind of an unusual thing and it happens to hit the day we're skiing down the mountain. (laughs) So we are in an almost whiteout. I have skied many times before. The wolf has skied many times before, but I have all these children that I've never skied, you know, and I leave. Well, I had, I had a choice. I could protect these five children that are um, skiing down the mountain, or I could protect the littlest children whom I am being forced to leave with my father-in-law and mother-in-law. And I say I'm being forced to do it because I'm forcing myself. Because I either let these children be in peril with 
a 119 pound idiot, or I leave these two babies uh, with abusive man. And he has never seemingly cared about babies. So it'd mostly be my mother-in-law taking care of them. And I thought, no, that's probably going to be okay. What else am I going to do? There's no good choice here. Turns out the entire time they had the babies, Madam Princess, who was just about 18 months old, is very, very sick with altitude sickness. And I get back to the house, which, by the way, I'm still running a fever. I still have all the problems I'm having. She's blue, man. Like, she's blue. And I freak out. And I go, oh, my God, I got to get her to the ER. Well, then, explosion from my father-in-law and the wolf. You can't take her to the ER. You just went to the ER. And we are going to have this huge bill. And it's going to be awful. And they're stupid. They don't know what they're talking about. I've had asthma my whole life. If you walk into a hospital not breathing, they take you. And the insurance makes it in network because it is a life-threatening issue. And I'm telling them this and I'm exhausted. I'm so exhausted and I feel like crap from head to toe. Everything hurts. And my children are all sunburnt from the snow and the skiing and we're, it's just terrible. And I lay down with her and we cuddle and we fall asleep. And the next thing I know, it's two o'clock in the morning and I sit up with her until seven o'clock in the morning and I get in the car and I drive to the nearest little town. And I walk into the only doctor's office there and I pray to God they're open and I pray to God they'll see her just to avoid the ER because I cannot deal with these two men. And the doctor looks at her and goes, oh my God, I don't even know how she made it through the night because this baby was getting no oxygen. So this is, and I'm thinking, I can't, I can't lose a child. You when, when you see your child fighting for their life in a cancer unit and you're having doctors tell you your child is going to die and the chemotherapy they're putting in their body is going to kill the good and the bad, but it could kill them totally. You don't want to hear from another doctor that this child, how did this child make it through the night? He puts her on an oxygen tank and gives her steroids and tells me to leave immediately back to Texas so that she can breathe. And I do. I've had minimal sleep, extreme physical exertion. I'm on steroids, antibiotics, painkillers. I go back to the house. I pack up my van I tell the teenagers to get in the van. I tell Banana to get in the van and I leave. And I drive all the way from Northern Colorado to West Texas. And I'm so exhausted. I'm just crying the whole time. And Madam Princess is exhausted. She's crying most of the time. And I get back to our ranch and my older brother, who is 13 years older than me, and he's he's very much an alpha male, but he has a very, very good heart. And he didn't say much to me, really, my whole life. He's, you know, my siblings are so much older to me than me that I wasn't very close to them. But he looks at me and he says, what kind of man lets his sick wife drive? All these kids with a sick baby, 14 hours by herself. And I just break. I just absolutely break. And I sleep. <laughs> I sleep for a long time after that. And I, um, and I have to really sit in deep prayer and meditation and... I just let him go. I let the wolf go in my heart. I stopped loving him that day. And I told my parents, I'm done. I just, I got to walk away. He's so sick. He's so sick. And I have no idea if my, I I left the tank and Super G with him and his parents. And I have no idea if these boys are going to come home alive. I have no idea. I have no idea if they're going to be hit if they're going to be punished for some infraction that they do, 
I have no idea. So we get back to Houston and, um, you know, I would have filed for divorce right then and there. Uh, <laughs> but we had planned to go to Peru in July with Harry, our oldest. So in our family, when you turn 15 for your 15th birthday, you get to go on a very big international trip of your choosing. And it's just that one child and the parents and he had chosen Peru and I couldn't ruin that for him. So I thought I I can stick it out until after this trip. It's just a few more months, but his weight was just coming off. It got to the point where he would only ingest celery juice. That is the only thing he would put in his body is celery juice and water. And his legs were swelling up. He stopped sweating. He was, he was tired. He was like a zombie. He was like a zombie in the walking dead, just walking around. I have no idea how he even kept his uh, job. I have no idea how he kept his job at this point. He's going in at nine, maybe 10, coming home at four. He has a very stressful job. I mean, it's not something you can just, maybe do one day and maybe not do the next day. I don't know how he kept his job, but it was, um, it was his birthday at the end of May and the kids made him little pictures and they given him his little pictures. And so I take a picture of him. He has a shirt off and I take a picture of him and tank. And I text that picture to his brother and and his wife, my sister-in-law. And his, he has a half-sister that's a, younger than him from a, another marriage. And I say, hey, uh, you think you guys can help me now? Because he looked like he had stepped out of a concentration camp. He is skin and bones. They are appalled. They're like, oh, no. And I've been telling his family for a very long time. Something is wrong with him. He needs help. Nah, he's fine. What's wrong with him? What are you talking about? Our family's perfect. We don't talk about, we don't talk about the bad things. Bless you. We don't talk about the ugly things. We like to sweep those under the rug. We must look perfect at all times. But we are able to convince the wolf to go to the ER that night. And when we walk into the ER, they take his blood pressure at 70 over 55. They took him to triage immediately. They flip him upside down. His heart is enlarged. He's like, there's nothing wrong with me, guys. What's the problem? I just have this inflammatory bowel disease. That's that's what's going on. I have this inflammatory bowel disease that causes me to lose weight. And I have to be careful what I eat. Otherwise, it'll, you know, inflame and it'll be awful. Through a series of events, we were able to convince him to talk to a eating recovery uh, center specialist. They were able to convince him to check himself into a eating recovery center in uh, Colorado. And um, they are able to refeed him. And the first week that he's there, I am given permission to talk to them about his medical. After that first week, I think he got scared that I would find out too much, and he took my name off of the medical release. So I only know the first week. In the first week, he was officially diagnosed with anorexia nervosa. He was also diagnosed with obsessive compulsive disorder. And what I was told is that with these eating disorders, it is a trifecta. And they knew there was a third piece. And they said, he is either bipolar, he is either um, autistic, or he has a personality disorder. But he refused any further testing. I now understand what that third piece is, and I believe it is narcissistic personality disorder. He meets all the markers. All the markers. and. And and so you have narcissistic personality disorder. This is just my opinion. I'm not a doctor. This is my experience with him. 
And then you have the obsessive compulsive disorder, which really falls in line with his um, profession. And then you have the eating disorder, which nobody can deny. I have pictures of this, this poor human being that was just skin and bones. But he came back and there was like this beautiful honeymoon period of, of he was just so nice. I had never experienced him being nice. And I thought, okay, well, I, I'm going to give him a chance because I had called a divorce lawyer, man. The minute he stepped on that plane, I was like, peace out. But my dad, my sweet dad, who just really sees the good in everybody, said, Carrie, you have to give him a chance. You, he's, he's trying to help himself. He's the father of your children. You got to give him a chance. And so I, and I trust my dad. I love my dad. It's like, okay, okay, daddy, I will give him a chance. And he came back. The first couple months were a um, honeymoon period, and he promptly got me pregnant. I told him I was pregnant. Uh, That pregnancy didn't take, and I was very sad about it. But what was worse was that the monster appeared. So it's like he had this monster in a closet. He was a monster hiding in the closet. And before rehab, the monster would peek his head out of the closet every once in a while, just enough to show me the evil side of him. But after rehab, that monster flung open the door and he came out of that closet and he never went back in. So January of 2020, the monster is in full rage, and COVID hits. COVID was the biggest blessing for me and my family because I have no kids in school. I can leave. I can go to the ranch. And I did for a long time. I would go back and forth, you know. Texas was very conservative anyways during that time of upheaval, this global, you know, phenomenon that was happening. It triggered his relapse, though, I think, in my opinion. He relapsed back into his eating disorder, Um, but he was nasty. He was nasty mean. He goes, we're buying a new house. This house is too small, and we're buying a new house, and I'm spending every bit of our money on this new house, so you can't spend one penny on your parents, helping your parents, taking care of your parents, or going to that ranch. I was just shocked. It's like, my parents are the one that saved your sorry ass. My parents are the one that wanted me to save his life. My parents are the ones that were begging me to save his life. Please get him to a doctor. Please help him. His parents were telling me that eating an eating disorder, that's bullshit. He has colon cancer. That's what's wrong with him. I was like, oh, my God. So you know what he did? He went and bought a house. <laughs> he went and bought a half a million dollar home, and he moved us to a different county, this is very important, a different county, and even though it was kind of close to where we were living, a different school district, it was a disaster. I was awful with him. He started hiding my keys. I couldn't find my car keys ever. So I took my spare keys and I put them in my jewelry box so that when I lost my keys, I would just not worry about it, get my spare keys, and then I'd eventually find them. Well, lo and behold, I realized every time I lost my keys, he was able to find them for me. Wasn't he the conquering hero? And then one day, he's like, hey, you lost your keys again. Where are your spare keys? I give him the spare keys. Spare keys are gone. I have no idea where they're at. Maybe they're in a toolbox. Maybe he threw them away. Just so he could hide my keys, be the hero to find my keys. I don't know. I don't know what was in his brain. But the keys... I was so anxious about these keys that I, I slept with them. <laughs> I like, put them like in the crevice between the mattress and my bed frame so that I would know my keys were right next to me at all times and I was never going to lose them because he really had me convinced that I was losing these keys. That is when he started breaking things. He would break them so he could fix them. And he would say, look, I fixed this. He's, he is very good at fixing things. He's a, he's a mechanical kind of guy. I mean, he knows how to fix things. He's very good and handy. He, he could probably build a house 
top to bottom and not have any, any problems, you know, take him forever because of his OCD, but he could do it and he could do it well. And at this point, I'm becoming stronger. I'm becoming more outspoken. I'm becoming more aware. Uh, I'm also in therapy. You know, the rehab center sent us to a marriage therapist. And we were in marriage therapy for eight months. And then I continued to see this therapist. And I'm asking him why, you know, so she's helping me understand what's going on with this guy and why I feel like I'm losing my mind. But this marriage counselor is the one that uh, she pulled me aside after meeting with us for several months. And she said, I want you to come up with a plan. And I said, what kind of plan? She said, we need a safety plan for you. And I looked at her cross-eyed. I was like, he's never hit me. I don't need a safety plan. She said, yes, you need a safety plan. You have to have a credit card in your own name. You have to have a key outside that you can get to. You have to have cash. And I'm very lucky. I'm, man, I'm lucky. I'm so lucky that I have a family. I'm so lucky I have a good family and I have property and I have a home that's removed and outside from him. Because I, I just, well, I could just go to the ranch. But he had been saying things to me and in our marriage counseling sessions and in private. If you leave me, if you leave me, bad things will happen. It is death do us part. We, we did get married in Vegas after Banana was born. So we were legally married at this point. But he said, if you leave me, I'm going to kill you. He told that to me, to my face, while he is blocking a doorway at, again, 2 o'clock in the morning because he loved to have conversations in the middle of the night to deprive me from sleep. And this counselor said, no, honey, you got to have a plan. I was just in shock. And I was embarrassed. And I felt ashamed. And I, you know, I listened to her but I didn't really hear her. This is all 2020, 2021. And the wolf is exploding about money. We have no money. We have no money. We're going to go broke. Okay. You make 150 a year. We live in a half a million dollar home, 3,800 square foot home. We have no money. Give me a break. I know, I see what's in our savings account. I see what's in, you know, I can see all of our financials. I don't have access to any of our financials at this point. I don't realize I don't have access to our financials. I didn't realize that until I had to do discovery for my lawyer that I actually don't have access to anything. I just could see everything and he gave me a credit card with my name on it. And that's how I bought everything was with this credit card. And he, so he makes, he makes me get a job. He's like, you have to go get a job. And I'm like, I'm homeschooling these kids. I'm a stay at home mom, but you know what? I kind of want a job. I want to get the fuck away from you. (laughs) I call a friend and I say, do you, I need a job lead. And, And she gets me a job teaching junior high theater in another district that my kids were at. And, um, we were all excited. I was excited. It was a fantastic job. The administration at that school was fantastic. I loved my students. I, I was voted favorite teacher of the year. I mean, I was really good at my job. And then I'd go home. I was kicked out of my home. I had to live in the apartment this entire year because I'm being told by the wolf, I'm so selfish that I took this job. You don't deserve to sleep in this bed with me. You don't deserve to sleep in the house with your children. Your children need you and you just went and took a job. You love your students more than you love your children. And so for an entire year, I slept in this apartment. And it was a really big, awful, terrible thing. And and it was under the guise of he needed his sleep. He was allowed to come into the apartment and interrupt my sleep. He was allowed to wake me up in the middle of the night and berate me and talk in circles about who knows, whatever it was that was bothering him that day but I wasn't allowed to interrupt his sleep. And this went on and on and on until about April 
of 22 or getting to the end of the school year. And I have asthma. I have such bad asthma. And my inhaler was out. And I keep all of our prescriptions and tote at the top of our closet so the kids don't get to it. It's 4 o'clock in the morning and I'm tiptoeing. I can't breathe. I'm tiptoeing because I don't want to wake him up. Because if I wake him up, it will be hell to pay. And I drop the tote, and there's a huge crash, and there's a big noise, and I am shaking, and I get my inhaler, and I'm like, he's going to kill me. He's going to kill me. It, it's like that first, that first time in the kitchen where he's so escalated, and his eyes are black, and he's shaking, and he's elevated. That was happening about every other week. Every other week, I'm bracing myself to be hit by this guy. And he never hit me, but he did start strangling me during sex. Sex that was expected, coerced. It was not like a willing, fun-loving, playful thing. It was not enjoyable. And the hitting, like... We're just being kinky. We're just, you know, we're just playing around during sex. But it was hitting me during sex. No bruises. <laughs> no bruises. I go get ready in the apartment. I come back to the kitchen and he comes in and he goes, what were you doing that you made such a noise? It woke me up. And I was like, I needed my inhaler. I'm so sorry. I couldn't breathe. He was like, really? You couldn't breathe? You couldn't wait one hour to get your inhaler? I was just, again, it was, I was the same feeling that I felt at the bar, you know, and he told me I'm just this unattractive, awful slob that he can't, you know, I'm like just devastated. And then I drive to work and I tell my, my coworker, I'm very visibly upset. And, and I say, can you take my kids? And so she takes the first three periods of my classes. I am under my desk bawling my eyes out on the phone with my parents. At this point, my parents are done. My dad is ready to get the shotgun. He is done. And this was the first time the word abuse came up. But my mom said, Carrie, this is abuse. He is abusing you. You do not keep someone from medical attention. So mid-April, I call a lawyer. And I tell her what's going on, and she tells me, there's no way in hell you're going to leave Houston. He's going to restrict you here. And I have a mental breakdown. (laughs) She said, the only way you're going to get out is if you can somehow take your kids to the ranch and live there for 90 days. And if you live in that county for 90 days, You can file in that county for 90 days, but you have to be able to get away from him. So my parents and I had a lot of conversations. My brother knew what was going on, and I was going to finish the school year, get the kids, and leave for the summer. And it was short 90 days, but I was going to figure it out and tough it out. I was just going to figure it out because he hadn't been to that ranch in years. He's terrified of my family. Um, my son graduates high school in May of 22 and my mom gets diagnosed with cancer and it is a big, fat, ugly tumor on her kidney. Well, of course, we're in Houston where MD Anderson is home and MD Anderson is a huge cancer center and we, you know, we're going to take advantage of that and we go to MD Anderson and they go to cut the tumor out of her body and they go, ooh. There's another cancer in there. Now she has two cancers, and the other one is appendiceal cancer, appendix cancer, that is so rare that one of the most internationally renowned cancer centers in the world only sees 75 cases a year. And they tell my mom it is uncurative. Because MD Anderson doesn't use terminal anymore. They say uncurative. So I can't leave Houston. Because now i got to save my mom. 
and I have to re-traumatize myself going into cancer centers, reading scans, and um, I think he had an inkling that I was going to leave because he got me pregnant. This man is obsessive compulsive about condom use until it benefits him. So I'm pregnant. I'm trying to navigate adult cancer, an adult cancer I'm unfamiliar with, help my mom. They're telling me maybe 15 months left with your mom. And I'm just crumbling. I'm never going to get away from this guy. I'm never going to get out. I miscarriage. I lose the baby. We get my mom kind of on a stable uh, maintenance program between Texas Oncology in West Texas and MD Anderson in Houston. And she's going back and forth. And I just kind of have this fleeting thought that, you know what? I, I can tough it out. I can just wait until Madam Princess is 18 years old and I can just go. So I, I go into the 22-23 school year with gusto. I'm just going to run it like a business. I'm just going to deal with it. I'm going to pull myself up by my bootstraps. I'm a, I'm a Texan. Damn it. I can do this. And it was terrible. It was so god awful. It was, he was so aggressive. He was so aggressive and he was getting more aggressive every day, physically aggressive, verbally aggressive. The kids were walking on eggshells every day. I could tell by their behaviors, by the time it got to 4.30, 5, 5.15, they were hiding in their rooms. They were arguing a little more with each other. They were clinging to me. They wanted to sit on me. They wanted to be like in my arms because he was going to be home and nobody wanted to be around him. So January of 2023, I, my parents actually approached me and my mom says, Carrie, I'm going to die. It doesn't matter if I die now or a year from now or two years from now or you have to get out. I, I don't want to die knowing that you're still with this man. So I say, okay, mom, when the school year ends, we're going to, I'm going to leave and I'm going to make that 90 days. I'm going to make it happen. And, um, and I tell my, (laughs) my oldest daughter, Jay, is uh, in therapy. We're all in therapy and we're in therapy for different reasons. I mean, childhood cancer was really tough on everybody. Hurricane Harvey was tough. I mean, you have these big, big key traumas that you do have to deal with, right? And we're also dealing with the wolf. You know, we are, we are in a wolf's cave through these big key traumas of life. And I, I went with her to her therapist. Her therapist called me and said, I really want to do a joint session. She's a junior in high school. She's very smart, straight A student extracurriculars, great human being, amazing, amazing girl. And it took two sessions. Within two sessions, Jay was able to tell me he is gaslighting her. She's hiding in her room. She's hiding her siblings in her room. She's hiding them in her closet. They are scared of their dad. They don't want to be around him. They refuse to eat in front of him because every other out of his mouth is don't eat that that's unhealthy you're going to get fat he is berating my banana about her weight she is healthy very athletically built girl she is not a string bean she's not fat she's not obese she's just thick she's muscular and he told this child she came to him and said i want to do dance she was in competitive cheer and she uh, did club volleyball. And I, she's like, I'm going to do dance. And he goes, oh, you can't do dance. You don't have the body to be a dancer. A 10-year-old little girl. And, Jay, and she's going to her sister, Jay. And, and Jay's hiding her, hiding her. I'm learning all of this in January of 23. Uh, and I tell... And I've been t- had many conversations with therapists. Therapists knew exactly what was going on with the wolf. 
from my perspective and in our marriage. And, um, and I tell Jay, honey, I'm, I'm divorcing him. I'm leaving him. And we have to do it very carefully and we have to be very safe about it. And she's so relieved. And I say, your senior year is going to look different. You're going to live with um, a, a friend of mine who's known Jay her whole life. You're going to live with her your senior year because I'm not going to be here. And she said, okay. Because I wanted her to finish her senior year. I wanted her to have that. In my stupidity or empathy or whatever you want to call it, I decide these kids should have one more family vacation with all of us as a family. So I... um tell the wolf, Hey, we're going to, we're going to have a family vacation over spring break. And he loves it. He loves, he's like, yeah, let's do it. And I choose a little Island off the coast of Alabama called Dauphin Island. So we go to Dauphin Island and, um, he's starving himself again. He's just so erratic with food. He's working out. He's found this group they call themselves the f3 group it's kind of a national men's group and they go work out and he's found the, these men and he's working out all the time and he's starving himself and we go on vacation and the night of the very first night we're there he gets into a fight with banana because he won't eat the dinner i cooked and she's mad the kids are being very vocal at this point why are you weird with food dad why don't you just eat the food dad why do you do gluten-free dad and listen, I'm not knocking gluten-free. I know a lot of people do it. It just, for his particular disease, it, it, it was terrible. They got in a big fight. He's mad. He throws all this salad and lettuce on his plate, eats it. We all go to bed upset. He gets up at 6 o'clock the next morning. And what are you doing? I'm going to take the boys to go find crabs. I said, Why? We're going to be here all week. There was this cold front that came through, which is very unusual for the Gulf of Mexico in March. And it was like 40 degrees outside. Like that's, that's like freezing temperatures to us Southerners. Like we're, we're not used to the cold. It was because I want to. Please don't take them. Every alarm in my head was going off. Please do not take these kids to go hunt for crabs. But he did it anyways because he was mad and he was righteous because he's right all the time, Mr. Right, all the time. And he takes those boys, and for some reason, Banana woke up and went with them. And I'm mad, and I call my mom, and I'm just furious at 6.30 in the morning. And she's like, Carrie, Carrie, you only have two and a half months, and you can get out. Two and a half months. Put on a smile. You can do this. Go take a shower. I never take showers in the morning. And I said, okay, mom, I'm going to go take a shower and calm down. And I'm in the shower. And Super G comes running in and he is white as a ghost. And he says, mom, Tank got hit by a car. What? Tank got hit by a car. And I fly out of the shower and I grab a towel. I have conditioner in my hair. I'm dripping wet. And I see my baby in a ditch. And I fly open Jay's room, and my niece is with us. She's 19, and I'm screaming, call 911. And I run back to the room, and I throw on this um, oversized sweatshirt, <laughs> butt naked, and I'm dripping wet, which I laugh at now. And I, I run down to the ditch, and I'm holding Tank's head, who never lost consciousness. He's screaming. He's begging to go home. He's begging for a shot. He doesn't even really know what a shot means. He's just in so much pain. His entire left side is obliterated. His femur snapped in half. His hip is dislocated. His elbow, his hands, his face, his skull, four grade four lacerated organs. On March 15th, this boy is hit by a truck. The seven-year anniversary of Super G being diagnosed with cancer. And he's life-lighted to Mobile, Alabama, 
the wolf and I jump in the car. I did, I did have the wherewithal to grab a pair of pants and a bra and my inhaler because it goes with me everywhere. And we're flying down the road and I start calling. I'm calling everybody. I need people to pray. I need people to pray for this baby. And by the third call, he looks at me and he goes, are you done calling people? I don't want anyone to know this happened. And I say, what happened? He said, well, banana wouldn't run. Banana would not run. We were going to run home. We needed to race home. We're going to, you know, move in our bodies. We're getting our bodies warm. So I tell the boys to run home, to run. And to run home means to cross a highway. And I'm running circles around banana trying to get her to run and burn calories and move her body. These are words he is telling me. And banana is not going to run. She knows his game. She's not going to do it. He is 50 yards away from those boys. And he is not paying attention to my children because he never pays attention. He only cares about himself. And there's a gentleman driving a one-ton truck who was not paying attention either. For whatever reason. And he just kind of veered into the bike lane where the boys were. And he just hit him. And he was two feet from hitting Super G. He could have absolutely mauled over both those boys. And I just, I can't believe it. And um, Jay had come down and she was helping me restrain Tank. The fallout of something like this is, is unmeasurable. The pain that this child experienced and, and the recovery. But Jay had already had the narrative in her head that she had to protect her siblings from this man because something really bad was going to happen. Because she knew it, and I knew it. And she lost her mind. She broke. She was, di- she was suicidal. Teachers and counselors were finding her under stairwells at school. She... um she didn't sleep for four straight days. She was diagnosed with PTSD. I mean, I was, I mean, I wasn't sleeping either. I was going from this doctor's appointment to this doctor's appointment. Banana has PTSD. Super G probably has it, but he's not been diagnosed with it. They all witnessed this horrific thing and they all know it's because the wolf was not protecting them. He did not, he won't, he can't. Like he's broken inside. Like he's a broken person and he just cannot think about anyone else but himself, even his own children. He looked at Tank three weeks later and said, yeah, you need to really look for cars when you cross the road. Like it was his fault. He's never apologized. He's never felt remorse. He's never cried. He's never gotten angry about it. He's just like, doesn't want to talk about it. Like it never happened. And if it did happen to, you know, his son's fault. We got back to Texas and I am keeping my daughter alive. I'm keeping my son alive. I am having to call schools. I'm talking to four different campuses. I'm talking to principals. I'm talking to teachers. This whole school district that I love with all my heart is holding my children up. This is a school district I ultimately had to flee from. I left so much behind to get away from this man and they are saving my children and um i call that lawyer and i say i'm done i'm filing if i have to stay here for the rest of my life i'm filing i got to get him away from my children she had the wherewithal to say please call their therapist and ask them how you should proceed the therapist got together said listen we agree that you need to get away from this man but these children has, have also gone through one trauma. 
give them time to process it, get back to school in the fall, get regulated, get on a schedule, then file. And that's what I did. Now, he, of course, blew up. This is against our religion, which I just died laughing because I'm like, what religion, buddy? You change religions every week. Give me a break. You know, like I know my Jesus and trust me, he don't like what you're doing. Like, I don't I don't play the religion game at all. And, um, you know, he wouldn't get a lawyer. He wouldn't cooperate. I was being very amicable, very quiet, very, because I had, you know, I had to play the game, right? I wanted things. I wanted to get the hell out. I wanted to move home. And we were going to do everything we could to try to get that, knowing that we probably wouldn't. But there was something beautiful about going to see our pastor. He, he talked me into seeing this pastor that I don't even know. Like, it was a new church. And I was like, okay, well, I hope the pastor brings his A-game because I sure know how to uh, research theology. Like, I'm not playing that abusive spirituality game. I grew up in the 90s evangelical purist bullshit movement. I'm not doing that again. And this pastor is a very sweet man. And a little naive, maybe, but he, he was a, he's a good man. And it was actually him who suggested to us that a separation might be a really good thing. And I went, you know, I, I agree. Maybe I should take the kids out of school to homeschool them again, because we'd already done that. And maybe I should move back to the ranch for a short time uh, while we work things out. And so the deal was if the wolf agreed to do this, I would agree to dismiss the divorce. And that's what happened. At this point, I'm working with a domestic violence advocate. I have a ther- my therapist who knows the wolf very well. She got to know him for eight months that we were in marriage counseling. I have two lawyers and friends and family to support. I didn't tell too many people, obviously, but they are walking me through this process step by step. I had the wherewithal to know I could not do it by myself. I was too worn thin by this man. I was too worried about my kids. You know, how many more traumas can we? (laughs) This is the third child I almost lost. Well, four. If you if you include Jay, I mean, it's like I moved back home in ninety days to the day I retained a lawyer, and seven days after I it was processed and filed. He found out about it. He had been watching the public records. So he quickly filed in his county and then went and hid at his brother's house so that the process server could find him. And then was texting me, how could you file? How could you file? So I'm like, I guess he found out, you know, like I'm here, whatever. And, you know, threatening me, I'm going to quit my job so that you can't get any money. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. Well, he'd already done it. The day before Jay graduated high school, he took me off all credit cards. He drained all bank accounts. He moved all money into an account I have no access to. He took every penny from me. And you know what? I didn't give a shit because I have a daddy and I have brothers and I have a family who love me and they're going to take care of me. And I had the strength to do it. And I have a son who is uh, in the military. And he loves his mama. This man can't touch me here. Well, I'm gonna, he told me, I'm going to quit my job. I'm going to follow you there. Okay, go ahead. You're on my home turf. My family's been here for six generations. Have fun. Like, I have so much strength here. I am myself here. And um, it's been a wild ride in the legal system and it, and it's not over and it probably won't be over till sometime in 2025. 
but I feel very good about where I'm at. I love my lawyer. And I will tell you, the lawyer I hired at that 90-day mark, I fired. And this is something I tell people a lot when I talk to, uh, uh, when I do like um, teaching young mothers how to advocate. Do not be afraid to fire your doctor, your nurse, your lawyer. They work for you. And she was not doing, she was not hearing me. She was not doing what I'm asking her to do. She didn't really believe me, honestly, about the abuse, I think, I'm guessing. So I fired her. And I got a new lawyer, and this lawyer is amazing. This lawyer is a shark. This lawyer understands domestic violence. But more importantly, the judge does too. So I'm on, I feel good, and I, I do want to, I do want to, bring my story to a close with this. This man ruined and tried to ruin and worked very hard to ruin every single thing in my life. And the way I describe it is that it's very erosive what they do. He was slowly eroding every part of who I was except he couldn't break three things. There were three parts of me that he couldn't break. And that was my relationship with my my dad and my mom. He could not penetrate that. He is furiously jealous of my relationship with my dad. He could not break that relationship. Try as he must, he could not do it. He could not break my motherhood. He couldn't do it. There is nothing that is going to get between me and my children. It didn't matter how many times he told me I was a bad mother. It didn't matter how many times he told me I was a selfish mother, that um, I was ruining my children's lives. It didn't matter. It didn't matter. Because I would not believe the lie. He could not penetrate that because I know I'm a great mom. And, and this may be silly and funny to the non-Texans that are listening, but to the Texans, you're going to get it. He could, not, he could not beat the Texas out of me. I am a sixth-generation Texan. And with that comes pride, grit, and drive, and perseverance. That is in my blood, and he could not take it out of me. And he tried. He even made fun of blue bonnets. So all the Texans in in the podcast world can go, ooh, what a jerk, because that's our state flower. We're proud of our state flower. He's like, oh, that looks like a weed. Give me a break. He could not do it. So I encourage you and beg you to find those things within you that they cannot break because Satan cannot take out what God has instilled in you. And, And those narcissistic people are evil they're evil and in the aftermath even though you're still in it what have been the biggest things that have uh, helped you in your process of understanding things that have happened and you know ptsd uh stuff that's going on Oh, man. I am huge on self-awareness and self-healing. I I did EMDR. I still do EMDR. I, I think it's voodoo magic. Like, it's incredible. It's And I don't know the acronyms, like eye movement something. And it basically takes the fractured parts of your neural pathways and the memory pathways and reconnects them. So that this trauma that you experience, like the trauma I experienced as a five and six-year-old, it took me 16 EMDR sessions, but praise God, I got through it. And, um, and it, it healed so much of me. I've done EMDR through all of G's, super G's, cancer. And I will eventually approach Tank and this abusive marriage that I've been in. Um, but, you know, baby steps when it comes to healing. You don't heal overnight. I look at Tank, and it took him three months to walk again. 
He didn't heal overnight. He's, he's got scars all over his body that took time to heal, but the scars are still there. You know, I have scars on my soul that are healed, but they're not open wounds anymore. And I think it's about understanding and learning where and what the wounds are and allowing them to heal. And, and you have to do that. You have to do that with multiple things. There's not just one thing. I mean, it was EMDR. It was meditation. It was yoga. It was somatic body work that got me through it. And it was, again, grit, drive, perseverance. You got to have those things and you have to have community. Go find somebody, talk to somebody. It's amazing how these personality disorders will isolate you. Boy, they are good at it too, aren't they? They will isolate you. Do not let that happen. I don't care if you have to make a friend on the city bus. Make a friend on the city bus. I don't care if you make a friend at the laundromat. Like, find a church, find a book club, find something. But you have to talk about it. Do not be silent. Use your voice. You have one. Use it. And I was going to ask you what your words of wisdom, your final words of wisdom for everyone are. And that you threw that one out first. So do you have any last words? <laughs> oh, man. I just want you to know that you are worth it. You are loved. Do not believe the lies they are telling you. Do not give up. Keep educating yourself. Keep listening to podcasts, reading books, articles, go to support groups. Don't stop. He wants you to stop. She wants you to stop. Whoever it is in your life, they want you to stop. My sister said something to me very profound. I had uh, dealt with suicidal ideation off and on my whole life as a result of this childhood abuse. And, and I'm truly scared of this man. I am truly, I have to take him at his word. He's threatened my life multiple times and I have to take him at his word. And I am scared of him. And I'm telling her I'm scared of him. And I'm telling her I'm really afraid he's going to kill me. And she said, no, Carrie, he's not. He's not going to touch you because he is expecting you to kill yourself. And I went, oh, my God, you're right. You're right. That's exactly what he's wanting to do. He is doing everything he can to trigger a suicidal ideation episode in hopes that I kill myself. They will do everything they can to stop you from your truth, from the truth. It's not even your damn truth. It is the truth (laughs) that they have taken and scrambled up into this delusion that they live in. Don't give up. Don't give up. Well, Carrie, you're done. Ooh, that was a long one. And in our initial call, I said to you, you're a natural storyteller. (laughs) You got this. And I don't think I said anything today. So you, you know, really knew your story front to back and knew what you wanted to tell people and wanted to educate them and wanted to share your experience to validate everyone. And you did that today. You did a great job in doing so. And something that others don't know about you, besides being an actor, you, know, you do have your own podcast, and part of the subjects of your podcast is you speak to um, parents who have lost a child and telling those stories. And it's that is uh, difficult uh, work to do, and you are patient with them, and you are understanding their trauma. And it's a lot of hard mental work that you're doing in space that you're giving on top of all of the work 
you're doing at home and everything that you've been through and you're just a really good person and um you know we'll put your podcast in the show notes if if you want for people to listen because i'm sure there's people out here who are listening who've gone through that experience and in need um a voice to hear that's yours and everyone else who's gone through that experience so a big thank you for being here sharing your story and sharing yourself uh for everyone to hear today and i'm happy you're all alive and in doing well and just a big thank you from the bottom of my heart uh, for being here today thank you so much well, thank you, Carrie, for being here once again. And if you want to be a guest like Carrie was today, please do go to our website at NarcissistApocalypse.com and click on the guest form button at the top of the page. There you can read all of our instructions. And please read them all and either send us an email at NarcissistApocalypse at gmail.com or fill out our guest form and press the submit button. And please do send it in the format that we ask for. Also at our website, we have a support group. So if you need support, join our support group by clicking on the support group button at the top of NarcissistApocalypse.com. Inside, you'll see that we have Zoom meetings every Wednesday night, Thursday afternoons, and Saturday nights. We have forum boards for you to post on to get the validation that you need from survivors just like you. It is a wonderful group of people on there, and you can make a lot of friends too. So if you need support, join our support group today. And if you need even more support, please do visit our friends at DomesticShelters.org. At DomesticShelters.org, they have articles and resources to help make sense of everything that you're dealing with. And they have every phone number, email address, web address for shelters and agencies, no matter how big or small the town you're in. DomesticShelters.org has it there. So if you need extra support, please do go to DomesticShelters.org. And we have other friends of the show called Shelter Movers. And Shelter Movers can be found at sheltermovers.com. And what they do is they help you move all of your stuff from your home and into storage. And that includes your pets and livestock too. So if you're trying to get out of domestic violence in courts of control and you need help leaving the home, getting all of your stuff out of your home and into storage, Shelter Movers can help you with all of that, including your pets and livestock too. They are currently only available in Canada and it is a donor supported charitable organization. So if you need help from them or just want to donate to them, go to sheltermovers.com. And that is it for today's survivor story for today's episode. So for myself, and Carrie, we hope you have a good night. <laughs>